some people that are important to me or live nearby or those kind of things are here. So um, over at the very cozy love seat here <laughs> is a very good friend of mine, Pat, Hi. who actually um, was one of the first people to get an advanced reader copy, um, meaning before it is released. And so she's read the entire yeah. book. Uh, my sister Erin, um, friends of mine, very good friends, and, and one of them here is actually mentioned in the acknowledgments, Mike and Deanna. Um, Deanna has accompanied me throughout the years on several research trips. So she's been up in the Porcupine Mountains with me, um, done some Copper Harbor stuff, um, went out to even the University of Iowa, I believe. We did a road trip there. So. Um, my husband, Greg, back there. Um, a couple of students of mine, um, Robert, Angela, and Catherine. Glad to see you guys here. Um, and then some family members, my sister-in-law, Nancy, and in-laws, Helen and Claire. So I think I've got it, right? All right. Okay. Um, well, I thought I'd do this rather informally tonight. Um, the, the situation calls for that, and I like that. Um, base 10 was um, quite a research process because the main characters in the novel are astrophysicists, researching astronomers. Um, but there was one part of, of their lives, or at least the main character Jillian's life, that I knew very, very well in writing it. And that was being the parent of a couple of children, um, working and still trying to find time for my passion, which was writing. Um, and when I first started to write this book, one of the things that Greg actually used to joke around with me about is a time we called the dark time, because I wasn't able to find any writing time. And so I wrote this novel from that drive of the idea of being kept away from what you need to do to be yourself. Um, nobody's fault, just the situation, working, having two kids, um, you know, trying to grow the beginnings of their lives and do what they needed. Um, so the novel actually has three strands that run um, kind of concurrently. And hopefully tonight I'll be able to kind of introduce you to those three strands. Um, first of all, Jillian, the main character, um, has been away from her stars in her astronomical research for many years, um, about 10 years. Um, she's been working privately, but she's, you know, pretty unhappy about the fact that her research has kind of ground down. Um, so in the novel, she takes off for 10 days by herself into the Manistee National Forest, which is on the northern Lake Michigan coast, and she camps out on the top of a 227-foot dune in an area called Nordhaus Dunes. So the 10 structure of the novel follows her for 10 days. Um, there's also her and her research partner, Kira, who um, have quite an extensive research past. Um, they met when they were undergraduates in college. Um, the two of them developed this idea for being able to look at really bright stars and try to seek out planets orbiting those stars. Um, and what they do is they develop an instrument, which they don't know really what they're developing when they start out, which is now called a coronagraph. And what the coronagraph does is a very, very bright star, of course, has very, very bright light, okay? And light waves as it moves toward us. <coughs> and what they invent this way to do, or at least they're trying to invent their way into it, is a way to block that light as it waves toward the telescope and kind of shear it off in a way so that what they hope to be able to see by the time the image is processed is anything that's around that star anything that already has its own light reflected onto it, the light that's no longer moving toward us. And don't worry, there will be no test there. But <laughs> um, So I researched with an astronomer some of you may have seen on campus this week as part of our Women in Science events, um, Dr. Eleanor Gates, who has a history, lucky for me, in, in a field called adaptive optics, where she has worked from the very beginning on the struggle to do different things with bright stars and bright objects. 
Um, and then finally, of course, Jillian has two children and a husband. Um, I know that life, many of us do. <laughs> and so there are a lot of chapters that deal with simply her, her significant memories from home. So I am going to start out in the beginning. Um, a very wise writing mentor of mine named Cedar G Stina Jeter Nasland always told me, whenever you do a reading, you must read the very beginning of your book. So, to Sina. <coughs> this is day one. It's titled, Settling In. After the bleaching sun and asphalt of the expressway, Jillian's turn onto Forest Trail was a turn into a world of color. Yellows, greens, browns, blacks heightened against a turquoise sky. Turquoise. The water, the big lake, must be feeding the sky. She had driven the busiest route on purpose, taking 23 north from Ann Arbor, 96 around Lansing, through Grand Rapids and on to Muskegon, to remind her as she headed further and further north along Lake Michigan's shoreline why she needed ten days alone. More than days. Through days filled with hiking to near exhaustion and nights standing at the water's edge, open to the stars, open to everything the stars had always meant to her, she would listen. She would listen so intently that only the cold water lapping over her toes would remind her she was of earth but still part of a great, infinite stir. She passed a huge brown sign with yellow gold letters stamped into its painted wood. You are now entering the Manistee National Forest. And she slowed to take it all in, the bright yellow patches of poplar and birch leaves among the darker greens of oaks and pines, and the forest floor covered with ferns, deep greens tinged with rust. It had been an especially hot summer. Even the air flowing through her windows felt saturated with hot and cold and color, and she breathed deeply, smelling the overly sweet scents of wildflowers in the sun, the tang of pine in the shade. For 10 or 12 miles, the road cut straight into the woods, and she couldn't help thinking of her typical drive home from the highway to the land of strip malls and research buildings on Victor's Way, past apartment complexes and condominiums and houses too big, big for their small lots, to her taupe, two-story house with a dormer built on a mild hill, before the neighboring fields were developed, before streetlights they had been able to see some stars. The road began to bend, and as she steered back and forth, past the campground loops, the violet, the oak, the orchid, and the hemlock. She could smell the lake. Occasionally, she spotted dark shapes deep in the woods. Black rounds looked like bears or figures staring back from behind the trees, and they made her think of Jack and Manny and Pia. Motherhood brought so much anxiety and fear. She had become so strong and so responsible for them but so worn down from herself, in those shadows, tree stumps, she knew, felt like warnings. Ten days in the woods was not going to be easy, but it was going to be. When Forest Trail ended in the only parking lot for miles, Jillian opened her door, feeling the lake's power gust in the wind. She jogged a pathway of recycled planks, tunneling through trees that rose from dirt as soft as ashes. The dark powder seemed to brew from bulging roots that wove themselves across the ground. Yes, this was a time to rejoice, time to reconnect with her joy. The path opened onto a broad deck and she stood, overlooking the dip and swell of the dunes and beyond that, nothing but water and sky. A sky sometimes frustratingly clouded with moisture, but a sky she and Kira had listened to for years, a beautiful, long afternoon turquoise sky. She closed her eyes and felt the sand and water and light wrap around her, billions of tiny photons and water and air molecules colliding with her skin from all angles. Day one, 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 and I made it. 
To her left, the Dune Ridge Trail began where timbers had been laid into the dirt to prevent erosion. It would be dark soon under those trees. She had to hurry. Back at the car, she checked her gear one more time. Her roll pack was stuffed with water, pouches of tuna, cheese, protein bars, and trail mix, one aluminum pan, and a tiny coffee percolator. She was roughing it, yes, but she couldn't be without coffee. Her clothes were all set, ring-dry nylon outfits, three bras, three pairs of underwear, tank tops, and a bathing suit. She had packed an assortment of necessities, 100 feet of corded rope, a flashlight with extra batteries, a simple first aid kit, salve, bandages, liquid sutures, and treated kindling sticks. She took out her topographical maps, two large sheets taped together, and smoothed them out across the car hood. She could have planned the trip using GPS on the computer, but the quadrangles, each representing 7.5 minutes of earthly rotation in painstaking detail, reminded her of earlier days when she and her father, and later she and Kira, headed off into the night with telescopes and a pocket logbook. The act of smoothing out the pale green and white sheets and locating the best observation points had always been the required sufferance before the adventure. And now, her first truly solo adventure would take place in the heart of this undeveloped tract of dunes and forest, 14 miles wide by 24 miles long, an expanse of solid greens and blues bound only by the white of Ludington to the south and Manistee to the north. The spot she had marked, 44 degrees 5.4 minutes north, 86 degrees 28.5 minutes west, was a four-mile hike away. At 5 o'clock, she settled her pack across the back of her hips, clasped the belt, and unbuckled her watch. Here, she would live by the sun and the moon and the stars, the water and the wind and the sky. She threw her watch into the trunk and locked the car. Pausing on the observation deck, she said a quiet goodbye to the few people she could see in the water below, their splashes cut by the wind in her ears. As she turned to face the trail, she was acutely aware of the one after another density of the trees. Earlier in the day, as she drove across the state, she had pulled into rest areas and paced, reciting her Manistee mantra, 10 years of marriage, 10 months of planning, 10 days to make it. And between each, she had whispered, day one, one, one. Already, the act of driving away had weakened the stranglehold of home. Freedom made other things important, the kids' faces, Jack's hands on her shoulders as she packed his lunch. He should have known something was wrong. <laughs> it's too fun, isn't it? <laughs> the deceit of her smiles, though she had made sure to say to the kids, see you soon, not see you tonight. A day trip wasn't going to bring about change. She needed space, that precious feeling of endlessness to figure out what came next. At one point, she had taken out her base 10 triangle, to think that a triangle, a diagram, could reset a life. But then, realizing she had taken more of Jack with her than she intended, she didn't need a list to tell her how she felt. She threw the drawing in a garbage can and hadn't stopped again. But those tens had been important. Ten years of staying close to home because she couldn't bear to miss their nightly tell about your day. She couldn't miss the chance to boost Manny back up when he'd sat on the bench for losing the basketball three times. His body was growing and everything about him was loose and sloppy. He'd get that tightness back. Because music was for Manny what the stars were for her, she understood. Why didn't they? Because Jack didn't notice those vague pauses between Pia's words, those shifts in her gaze and the crooked grins that said she was having trouble with friends. Some new grouping of girls was shutting her out, and because it hurt too much to blame her friends, she was trying to figure out what she'd done wrong. Ten years of developing software for other researchers because she could, because working at Burton's wasn't such a bad job. Ten years because she could still hear clearly Manny's cries the one time she did leave. Let me come with you. I can help. 
Her boots clumped across the deck until her heels hit dirt. This was what she had to do, put one foot in front of the other and walk. Stepping over the timbers, with her ankles flexed hard, she entered a path of trees. She let the kids' faces pester her, remnants of long glances from the night before flooding her mind. She'd take the kids with her, but not Jack. No. <laughs> she had never shared this place with Jack. She wasn't about to pack him in with her now. Standing over Manny and Pia as they'd slept, she had worried that her anxiety might leak into their dreams. She had lain parallel to Manny on his bedroom floor, knowing the slightest pressure on his mattress might wake him. Pia was either on or off, moving or asleep. Jillian had been able to touch her face. It helped to think of their faces now, Pia's darkly golden and Manny's so fair and blonde, when her back, the back of her legs, the back of her pack even, burned to turn around. Not for someone or something, really, but to capture, visually, confirmation that the world behind her was being sealed off by the trees, that she was being folded into the forest. So that is the beginning, the very beginning, as Sina would say, that I had to read to you. Um, Jillian's off into the woods. Um, she's going to set up a tent and be quite industrious um, on her 227-foot dune. Um, and because she's an astronomer, of course, um, the stars and as evening falls, that's a, a great es excitement to her. But there is also this thing about being out all by yourself um, with miles and miles of space around you that, you know, does instill some fear. Um, so um, she has some, some trials, I guess, while out there. And um, I think I'll read you a little, little section of the middle of that. A little more background for, for her. She gathered twigs and dried needles, used one kindling stick and two bursts off her lighter, and sat beside a fire. Strands of clouds, way off to the west and heading north, she wasn't worried, were undercoated in fuchsia. Reds and purples fanned into lavender overhead, and within, in, within minutes, she watched the reds reach out and draw back. Now, all she had to do was wait. Enjoy her fire and wait. But waiting, without the stars, left her vulnerable to the catch in her chest when she followed the colors of the sky southward and thought of them all 250 miles to the southeast over the trees at home. Jack would have read her note several times, Ten days he would have read and reread, not quite understanding the duration. Maybe more, who knows, I've never done this before. The this in her note had been carefully implied to suggest the act of putting herself first, restarting a life continually put on hold, taking time that should have been hers all along, time that she was taking now to figure out how to salvage her science. She had planned to pack the note in his lunch, so that he'd find out she was gone after the fact, but then she decided that was wrong. Her note announced nothing new, certainly nothing she had to hide. So she asked him to stay until the kids left for school, which created quite a stir. Jack was always the first one out the door. She handed him his lunch and said simply, I'm leaving. So am I, he'd said, bending toward her to give her a quick kiss, as if she'd meant I'm leaving for work. No, she said and he stopped, perplexed, as she handed him the note. His pale blue eyes were so relaxed, so unlike hers, she felt embarrassed remembering how he'd followed her to the car, looking back and forth from the note to her, saying, what am I supposed to tell the kids? He had stood there in that loose-backed posture, nervous, she figured. Before she could call her plan silly and decide not to drive away, she'd put the car in reverse and called out as she backed down the driveway, tell them I had to leave, something to do with the Planet Finder project. The kids had heard her talk about the conference, watched her night after night poring over old drawings and images of her and Kira's last spectral studies at Lick. They knew she had exhumed something important, 
very important, and her time to present was drawing near. Jillian pictured all of them in the big bed, Jack pulling Manny and Pia close. That's how Jack expressed his love. He pulled everything to him. The crackles of her tiny fire echoed into the woods, and she turned several times, knowing there was nothing behind her. But the hairs on her neck rose when she didn't look. A dune chair. She would dig a dune chair with an arch for her neck, just as Kira had taught her that first time Jillian had spent a few nights at the depot on her way back home from school. Her parents had been so surprised when she didn't come home immediately that June, but they weren't hurt. Jillian had found someone like herself, a girl who drew with math and loved the stars. Just a few feet down from her tent, into the slope of the dune, she dug her own shape from the sand. Over and over she sat and pressed her body into the slope, and finding creases that needed smoothing, she scooped and smoothed again. The sand cooled and the horizon warmed with an intense cerulean glow, an oceanic fullness of color her mother had always loved. The brighter stars, Altair, Vega, Lyra, began to appear. To the south, she couldn't help it, she kept looking south toward the depot. Toward home, too, she supposed, though home was far to the east and over the trees. Scorpius was visible with his orange-red heart and Terra's. She squinted, reducing her view to lights and darks, searching for clusters and nebulae beyond Sagittarius's cocked arrow. If the skies remained clear for the new moon, she might see the central bulge of the galaxy, where millions of hot, white stars orbited in a chaos of heat. To the north, Cassiopeia cleared the trees. Soon, the queen of the night sky would drag, at, drag Andromeda, Perseus, Perseus, Ares along with her. What an incredible black backdrop for Capella, Algal, Aldebaran, the orange eye of the bull. And finally, the Pleiades would emerge, zenith blue. Um, part of the first day, Jillian out in the woods. Um, like like being outside by yourself, if anybody's ever been in that situation where you're physically pushing yourself to do something adventurous and you, you doubt yourself or have moments of fear that push past it, um, Jillian has at the, end of a at the end of the first chapter um, her own moment of fear. Um, throughout the book, there's this very strong tie between her and her thoughts of her daughter. And part of that comes from being a woman who knows what it's like to um, put herself on hold during child really rearing years. How does she tell the d her daughter the truth of that experience? At the same time, she keeps telling her daughter, you can do anything you set your mind to. The Pleiades is an important um, star cluster in Jillian and Kira's lives, too. So you'll hear it pop up again. The Pleiades is a group of um, stars that are actually born from the same gaseous pre-stellar cloud. And what's unique about them is they're all literally in close proximity to each other. And the Greeks and several early astronomers had stories about them, and they're often called the Seven Sisters. And so there Jillian is outside. Um, and I'll read you the, the end of chapter one. She's out in that dune chair still, trying to put up with the night on her own, trying to tell herself she's silly for feeling these, you know, hair-raising scares. She relaxed her eyes and followed the Milky Way to the southern horizon, where Sagittarius was sinking into a band of purple. She tried to lie back, tried to breathe in for three, out for three, but increasing number of black flies filing flying silently in the bowl of the dune, began to bite at her ankles. Another fire, close and constant, that's what she needed. She trudged up the dune, club in hand, to fill her arms with kindling, and in her trudges up and down, Jillian designated her chairs high and low dune chairs, two star viewing choices every night. And later, when she was feeling brave, she would sit at the water's edge, 
float, maybe. She carved a sand table close to her low dune chair, chopping in and smoothing the sand away with the side of her hand, again trying to ignore the chill. She arranged the largest twigs into a teepee, lighting the kindling at the base of her new tiny fire, and though she had planned a sleepless night, the tiny puffs of heat warmed her and she dozed. She imagined herself afloat on the silvery black water, lulled by the waves, starlight streaming through her. Jack stood above her, his palm under her back, supporting her. She had never been able to float. He twirled her slowly around, his head cocked to the side, his mouth open barely. When he smiled, the blue in his eyes deepened with tiredness, and Jillian knew she was being foolish. She had vowed not to associate Jack's smile or his hands or his eyes with comfort. Pia came to her next, fast and hard, her dark-rimmed eyes lit up with obstinance, stomping her foot in her black go-go boots. Pia's strength lay in her commitment to her emotions. She was going to stomp and stomp anyway, so Jillian took her long, narrow foot, Pia was so tall already at eight, and stomped it ten times, ten times for ten days without Pia's glare. When Jillian was young, like Pia, she had asked her father, do you think the stars watch us like we watch them? They both knew the answer, of course, but her father, always teasing, had said, wow, how many eyes would a big guy like Beetlegeist have? Through Manny's eyes, because Manny was always watching her and she watching him, Jillian saw herself curled into that world of sand, water lapping from below, the forest pressing from above. She felt the sky overtaken with Manny's colors, his eyes a dark mixture of blue and gray like hers, but flecked with gold. Perhaps she was seeing the first of the per Perseids. She had timed her stay to coincide with the meteor shower. No, it was Manny, insistent. How could she love this world more than them? Jillian wanted to explain. It wasn't that she loved the stars or the lake or her research more than them, but she needed to understand once and for all how to deal with the longing. How could she tell tender, young, idealistic Manny, almost 13 years old and just beginning his own quest for self, that sometimes you simply couldn't get what you lived for? From deep in the forest, perhaps from her own unconscious, came the cool vapor of an even deeper question. How could she ever, ever tell Pia that having a second baby had marked the beginning of the end of her very own quest? Finally, the Pleiades appeared. She had learned after years of observations to track movements of the stars through uncooperative eyelids, waking herself when her target drew near. With her binoculars pressed to her cheekbones, Jillian studied the brightest stars in the cluster, seven beautiful young stars whose light was incredibly purple through the specialized coatings on her lenses. And then, feeling as if she had accomplished a great goal, her best night of seeing in such a long time had not gone to waste. Bitten by flies and nearly out of twigs, she retreated to her tent. She lay inside with the mesh windows fully unzipped and tried to keep watch for the movement of the stars. But the image of the man kept popping into her mind. Earlier in the chapter, she has this visage, this vision of a man walking down below the dune that she's on. Sometimes, as her eyelids met, he appeared between the trees or under her food cable, rattling her plastics to wake her. Other times, she woke just as he was about to stick his head in the tent flap. Exhausted, she grabbed her club and her flashlight and her sleeping bag wrapped around her. She walked down to her high dune chair and backed her way into it. Trying to find comfort in the muffled waves and the glitter glittery trail of the Milky Way, she looked up at the Pleiades, clouded with moisture, but still present as a ring of light, and sighed. A sigh so frustrated and pained that she might have cried if she were not so intent on listening to the air around her. But then, sick of crying, she called out over the lake, What do you want from me? The sound, the sheer noise of it, felt good. She looked up at the stars, all of them now, accusing of her not longing, not fighting enough for them, and she repeated in a whisper, what do you want from me? 
But then her question, sent out over the lake and into the universe, sound as misdirected as a question could, and it brought back a sickening memory. Pia was a tiny baby, maybe six or eight weeks old. She was hungry, always hungry, but not like Manny. Pia was a gorger. She would breastfeed furiously, then turn her head and spew out Jillian's milk. Hungry again, she would scream for more. One night, Jillian was walking around and around the house with Pia screaming in her arms, screaming with another hour to go before there could possibly be enough milk to feed her again. And with sleep so far away, Jillian had snapped. Her arms shaking, she lifted Pia above her, not way above, but above. She held the screaming baby over her face and whisper screamed, what do you want from me? She hadn't truly shaken Pia. As soon as she hoisted her and let the question go, she watched Pia's head barely rock side to side, maybe a centimeter forward and back, but she hadn't shaken her. Jillian's hands supported her baby's neck. Her mother hands cradled the back and sides of Pia's baby head. The shaking had come from her own tired arms. Still, her baby's face bobbed and took notice. Pia, hoisted in the air, stopped crying. Filled with an awful, aching guilt, Jillian had held Pia close, settled Pia's tense stomach across her forearm, and gently bounced her from kitchen to living room and back, while Pia screamed and Jillian cried. She'd been alone with both kids, day and night it seemed, with Jack teaching and setting up a new lab. And she had snapped. She had snapped. She hadn't truly shaken Pia. Of course she hadn't. But what if she had softened the bobble of Pia's head in her own memory? Astronauts, some of the women Kira met in training, said they all went through it. Some kind of internal breakdown was necessary before they could settle into the isolation. Even on the ground, in simulator tests, if they were left alone on one of the space station pods, they felt it. With black flies bombarding her face, they were after the moisture in her tears. Jillian lit the end of her driftwood club and planted it next to her in the sand. She would get through this night and nine others. She would, whether she slept or not. She looked up at the Pleiades, now slightly west. Wisps of moisture were gathering above, blowing in off the lake. Individual stars within the cluster were no longer crisp. But their combined light, with the boldness of aqua and the resonance of periwinkle, shone through. From the universe, she should ask for patience. There was some flaw in her at work against her. She apologized to the Pleiades. She had never told anyone, not Jack, not Kira, not even her mother, about that night. She looked up at Cassiopeia and gave voice to her fear. I'm sorry. Jillian always feared she had caused some defect in Pia that made her behave in hard, fast, emotional ways, that she had sheared Pia's tiny, tiny spinal cord or ruffled her growing nerves. Strangely enough, as Jillian faced the Cassiopeia in the sky, the Pia in the sky seemed to smile. I'm sorry. So, the end of chapter one. A um, little bit of Jillian and Kira and their first exciting discovery. Um, one of the reasons Jillian has gone out to the Nordhaus Dunes area and the Manistee National Forest. <laughs> Are you all right, Pat? <laughs> Everybody else all right out there? <laughs> Comfy? Okay. Somebody give me a high sign if you've had enough, okay? Or maybe just start waving furiously. You could walk out. That works usually, too. <laughs> I'm enjoying the cozy fire. I don't know if it's putting you guys to sleep. Um, near that location in Ludington, there's the Big Sable Lighthouse. Um, many people call it Big Sable, but the, the original people around there will tell you it's the Sable, Little Sable and Big Sable Rivers and Big Sable and Little Sable Lighthouses. Um, and there's 
a time when Jillian and Kara are actually climbing that lighthouse, when Jillian sees through the trap door of the top something that interests her in the whole concept of how she might screen out excess starlight away from the stars. And that's how the idea begins. That's why this place is so very important for her to go back to that place of a universe of possibility. So the novel drifts back and forth between Jillian's 10 days out in the woods and these memories from the far past and her trying to rescue a future. So far past. Kira was on Big Sable's spiral staircase, ahead of Jillian a rung or two, holding the flashlight as they slept, stepped deliberately to Kira's cues. God, this is an odd sensation, Jillian said. The leafy pattern on the wrought iron steps cast shadows on the outer wall of the lighthouse as they climbed. It feels like we're going around in a huge circle, doesn't it? Around and around and around. Keep your hand on the wall, Kira cautioned. I am. Jillian was hyper aware of the iron spiral that held the steps together. How many windows have we passed? Kira patted each stair with her foot, testing. I'm having enough trouble watching my feet. Now you want me to watch windows? Are you crazy? Jillian was engrossed in her own system. One, two, shove it toward the spire. Three, four, shove it toward the spire. They were climbing the downed lighthouse its historic light taken down for repairs, in the dark. That had to be some kind of record for hardship, hardship endured for a night's good viewing. She tapped Kira on the back. We're crazy, and Kira stuttered forward. Jilly! The flashlight wobbled, spraying the walls with dancing leaves, but Kira held on to it, thankfully. Whoa. Big whoa. Jillian patted for Kira in the dark. Sorry. You feel that? I've got to sit a minute. The spinning sensation was powerful. Jillian looked down, trying to gauge how far they'd come, not even halfway from the looks of it. It's the competing spins, the physical force through the stairway and all these shadows swirling around. She set her feet, one crammed into the central spire, the other heel against the outer guard, and looked up. Through the rectangle of the open trap door above, she saw the stars huge and tiny and medium points of luminescence, all incredibly distinct. Hey, she found Kira's shoulder. Look at the stars. It's the Milky Way, Kira sat, holding her head. I don't know what's up. My sinuses, I guess. I've climbed this light a million times. Yes, Kira had said that the Milky Way, from the vantage point of lying on the lighthouse walkway, surrounded by miles and miles of darkness, would leave Jillian speechless. But what Jillian saw now wasn't an expanse, but a crop, a cropped image that seemed to lend more definition to each star within the tiny rectangle of sky. Shine the stairs for me. Climbing a twist above Kira, Jillian stopped and sat. She tilted her head back, cheek pressed firmly against the center pole, and whispered, afraid to break the moment, turn it off now. Don't move then, Kira whispered, stay put. Jillian had no desire to move. She was transfixed by the stars. So what Jillian sees is this very sharp kind of image of stars that are budding up against the edge of this cropped viewpoint, this rectangle and the round spire of the lighthouse. Um, and what she does is she theorizes a little bit about something she does at her print shop and work to kind of screen out bright glare coming from the plate making process. I'll let uh, Kira describe the science for you. <laughs> Kira, look up. Look how sharp they are near the edges. Kira's two-tone voice split, rising low and husky. They're perfect. Jillian wanted to tease, save the Lauren Bacall for some guy. But she felt the tingle of a new idea, and she didn't want to lose it. More than perfect. Look near the edges. Kira cleared her throat, and that vibratory mix of low and high returned. Sharp, aren't they? Much sharper than usual. Yes, ultra-sharp, as if the stars that butted up against the open doorway were throwing less light less glare. 
Kira, explain interferometry to me. Why? You know what it is. I know, I know, but just let me hear it step by step. Kira's study of detectable radio wave emissions from objects in space had bored her senseless. She had gone to the desert, imagining sitting high above a mountain canyon, wearing headphones and listening to sounds bouncing off asteroids, and found herself instead the only woman at a small three-dish radio array in Arizona, assigned to daytime frequency observations, watching a single amplifier needle for an occasional non-regulated bounce. She'd been bored, yes, but she'd learned a lot about pr the process of combining signals from several telescopes. Well, interferometry literally means to interfere and to measure. So, as light moves toward us, it waves up and down in crests and troughs. And if you know the exact distance from one wave to another, which is wavelength, you can combine the light from two or more telescopes so that the peaks of the waves match up to get the brightest, highest resolution picture possible. Okay, now, Jillian looked down, purposely trying to connect with Kira, though all she could see was the puff of Kira's thick hair. Supposedly, you could do the same thing in reverse, right? Instead of intensifying the light, you could nullify it by combining several telescopes. Now she could see Kira's upturned face. Well, yeah, in theory, I guess, once you have a working interferometer, you can interfere constructively or destructively with light waves. But it's really complicated. The idea is to delay one set of waves by exactly half a wavelength so the crests of one wave combine with the troughs of another and they cancel each other out. And then you have to repeat the process over and over to suppress the light to any noticeable degree. What if we didn't have to? What if we could mask the brightness away? Jillian scooted down the stairs. Can you climb again? Here, let me take the light. We'll keep it along the center pole, then these damn leaf shapes won't keep spinning around us. So Jillian goes on to explain the beginning of their ideas, that they're going to find these way to create these masks that shave the light away, and eventually what they're going to do is create this darkened areas around the stars, where if there were any planets or something orbiting, they'd be able to see them without the bright light of the star getting in the way. All right. Um, I'd like to read a little bit to you of some of the fun I had with this kind of character. Um, recently at the AWP conference, so for the, a couple of you that have heard this, sorry for the repeat, but it's just too much fun. Um, one of the things that, that I, when I really felt um, like I was hitting my stride with this character and really having fun, was being able to use the kind of knowledge that she would have in physics and math, um, even as part of her own internal rants about life in general. Um, and when I presented at the AWP, AWP conference in Chicago, I was presenting on the basis of, you know, how do you create this character that has vastly different knowledge than you do? You know, and I, I'm not a scientist. I love science. I love the sense of wonder, but uh, not my first inclination to think this way. Um, and the, the, probably the central chapter that talks about Jillian Spark in the first place, back to herself, back to the stars, to figure out how she's going to handle this, is she actually goes to a presentation um, by a NASA astronaut who's a woman. Um, and this woman, Evelyn Young, who's actually a fictionalized version of a real-life astronaut named Eileen Collins. And Eileen Collins was the first and only woman so far to actually drive the space shuttles. And she's driven lots of them. She just recently retired at the ripe old age of 50. Because <laughs> she wanted to spend more time with her family, actually, instead of driving space shuttles. She figured she'd done enough. Um, but Jillian goes to this presentation, and at the same time that she's extremely proud of this woman, she realizes that the root cause of why Evelyn was able to keep going and why Jillian stopped was just one single demarcation on the point line of time. And the, 
that really drives her crazy, that good old linear time has beaten her after all. No matter what she knows about the universe and space and everything else, the clock got her. So here's me having fun with Jillian's mind. Um, she's driven away from this presentation by Evelyn Young, the fictional astronaut, and she's using bits of the science in that presentation to kind of reposition herself in her life. After a quick drink. It was Evelyn Young's Edge of the Universe presentation that drove Jillian to the roof, eventually, indirectly, but first she drove home, feeling like space junk. Floating 500 miles above Earth, there were over 8,000 pieces of space junk. Metal, plastics, bagged biohazards, dating way back to Sputnik. So many items that agents of the government, privates in the Air Force, NASA specialists, were assigned the task of monitoring their flotation. Why couldn't Jillian float? That's all she wanted, to drive, to change lanes, to exit the freeway senselessly. But no, she drove home, her head full of lines and curves and Evelyn Young, and such conflict. The immediate rousing heat of you can do anything and don't give up, left stranded and unusable because she knew Deep down where knowledge was older and colder, there would be no after. What had ever made her believe she was so special? Evelyn Young, Air Force pilot, top in her astronaut class, the first and so far only female space shuttle commander, had done everything before. And Jillian had taken the message to heart. No woman did it after. And the after she's talking about is after having children. A little more fun with Jillian. This is this kind of mind at the grocery store. On her way home, she stops. Has to pick up some food for the family. At the grocery store, she put the bag to spinach and had lettuce and Roma tomatoes on the belt with the tag board and colored index cards she'd picked up for Pia. And she thought about baseballs and saddles and flat pieces of paper, about positive and negative and zero curvatures and what each meant to the shape of space. She had positives baseball, her sphere of lettuce, and negatives saddle. She depressed the spinach bag at its center so that it resembled loosely a saddle. And for zero, she had tag board and innumerable flat planar index cards one only had to imagine them going on and on forever with nothing above or below. She thought these thoughts and arranged groceries just so to protect herself, she figured. Why should she accept in a universe so vast and pliable, a life reduced to only one point on such a crooked, crooked path, before or after? Our position in the universe whether we were spinning on a singular plane or stretching the skin of our cosmic balloon was not so fixed. Space had warps and grooves and distensions, even interruptions of sor sorts in the distribution of mass, but we didn't hold that against the universe. We were fascinated by fluctuation and variation. We saw creation in space and we were stunned, but here on Earth, we wanted to lock it down. Jillian's not without humor, though. I realize in this reading where uh, there are points of humor that she definitely has and fun moments. Later in that same evening, she is... Um, sitting at the table, doing their tell about the day, you know, the agonizingly slow story from one to the other going around the table. And instead of the shape of space, she starts to see um, 
particles of light, quarks, dancing around the table. And when her family doesn't understand or isn't listening to her, she pelts them with these particles of light with quarks, just for fun, of course. They're not getting hurt. At the dinner table, Pia gave the order for their nightly ritual, tell about your day. They would go clockwise, starting with Pia, a mistake, then Manny, then Mom, then Dad. What could she tell? That she'd found hope and despair in a pair of neon pink space ovaries? It didn't matter. The universe had not let go. Jillian found herself watching her family through a flurry of subatomic activity. Evelyn had told them how space, the sky, the air around us with ru was rushing with neutrinos, particles that streamed from the stars and passed through everything, water, rock, humans. And Jillian had loved her for it. Most people figured kids couldn't handle it, the invisible, the indefinable. But that was the point, wasn't it? First, we must imagine. What was astounding about neutrinos was their shape-shifting sh shape abilities. As they hurled toward Earth, they seemed to rotate and spin, bouncing off something invisible, changing from one flavor to the next as they traveled through space. But the particles assembling over the dinner table were quarks, not neutrinos. Jillian recognized them from the particles of light model she had been working on. No shape-shifting secrets revealed today. Today, her own turquoise, yellow, and fuchsia quarks hovered in a cloud over the dinner table. Jack said to Pia, okay, you're first. Tell about your day. Quarks shifted in a wave as Jillian changed her gaze, and she smir smirked at their mocking. Had she really believed the world would wait for her mind? Yes, some part of her had been stupid enough to believe because she'd given the, w the universe these children. Well, Pia began, pulling the crust off her bread, making a hole in the center, using it as an eyepiece to scope out Jack. Jack made a circle with his fingers and eyed her back, and the quarks framed this for her. This was what she'd waited for. And the, excuse me, for this excruciatingly slow, small cycle of wakings and workdays and book orders and tell about your days, in which Pia reenacted every move and Manny chewed on. Ask me things, Pia said. Ask me about math. Okay. Jack reached for the rolls, sending corks streaming like a nest of disturbed wasps. Tomorrow, she would try neutrinos. She knew enough to get started. She knew that neutrinos passed through the human hand at a rate of 1,500 trillion per second when that hand lay still, and that they had bigger antiparticle cousins she hadn't kept up with. Jack's hand withdrew, and the wasp-like activity settled. What'd you do in math today? Jack looked at Manny, and Manny rolled his eyes. Quarks buzzed around his head and zoomed back to Pia. Letting Pia go first was a big mistake. She'd never finish a bite of food. Well, Pia elongated the word, making it last while she ripped another piece of bread into strands. She stood up from her chair and laid strips of bread, like flower petals, around her spoon, and the quarks danced above her flower. Finish a sentence. Sit down, Jillian said sharply, and the quarks scattered. To hell with nutrition. If the girl never ate another square meal in her life, but she followed her dreams, wasn't that what Jillian wanted? Manny dug into his spaghetti, and the quarks whooshed him by. Sorry. Jack touched her arms, and the quarks that had been racing around the table slowed to swirl around her and Jack. Why didn't he see them? Why didn't he feel their tiny, busy pressure? Pia, Jack said her name firmly to get her attention, sit and eat. Okay, okay, Pia said, but you have to ask me things. Manny made his comment, oh, this will only take forever. La lately, Manny was unable to let any situation pass by without tagging it with some smug summary. Forget anyone else's day. Pop, 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 pop. Quirks bounced from Manny's side of the table, assaulting the rest of them, and Jillian was tempted to duck, but she sat firm, taking Manny's energy beating while Jack and asked Pia questions. How far are you in the multiplication tables? She'd surpassed the twelves. She'd come home with that story yesterday. Dad, I'm doing random facts. Wow, past twelves, huh? Pia stuffed a piece of bread in her mouth. Oh, yeah, ask me some. Jack and Pia, ever doing, challenged each other with equations. Quarks encircled the two of them, turquoise and yellow and fuchsia, moving in little pitches and swells, a border of scalloped lace. 
Manny chewed, and Jillian found her tell. Let's be honest, she would say if she were There are pieces of me sent out. Quarks streamed away in waves, but they never come back. The quarks hovered, scared, waiting. I can't possibly exist without you, is that it? My mind has nothing but space for you? This was what she could never impart to Jack, how being married and having children could make her feel so small, so not special. People beamed their expectation into her eyes, sometimes so forcefully she had to turn away. Of course your children are your choice. The quarks moved from one quarter of the table to the other, trying to find refuge. There seemed to be nothing Jack had not accomplished. Your thoughts are my thoughts, huh? Your dreams, mine too? Mine fall away like petals of a flower because yours come pushing up through? Faced with her hardened, honest face, seeing no smile and no takes back, take backs either, the quarks plummeted, rolling from the table and onto the floor harmed, weakened, shimmying. And then just one final thought from Jillian. Um, one of these moments sealing off the moment at the dinner table. Jack scooted Pia away from the piano, keeping his body between the two kids as he made them clear the table. And Jillian sat, struck by the chaos. How intuitive someone had been to call the chaotic modern family nuclear right? <laughs> Could it be that the insides of an atom understood that they stuck together out of some intricate, particulate sense of responsibility to the whole of matter? Thanks, everybody.